Appreciate being a part of this and appreciate being here. I hope I can lend a little bit of support to the work you're doing. I think it's phenomenal that uh, you have a room like this with so many people from all across the region who are really interested and, and concerned about uh, turning around low performing schools. I think that's an important issue that um, is a very important issue to me and one that uh, you are to be thanked for being a part of. So. Um, I want to thank you for letting me be here and um, say very clearly as I launch on this that um, nothing that I say here suggests that we have it all figured out in Tennessee. Tennessee is just as fluid a situation and, and, and just as evolving a situation as any other area and uh, the area that you're in is of course no exception and the idea is that uh, we've had, uh, we've gotten from other people, we've stood on other people's shoulders, we've worked with other people. and. We've modified those ideas. So hopefully this will be a great opportunity for some exchange and some dialogue. I'm really looking forward uh, probably most of all to the conversation because it gives me an opportunity to kind of shine a mirror in my face and see what it looks like from outside of Tennessee and give me some perspective as well. So I'm looking forward to learning with you today and appreciate uh, the time and effort that you've put into it. So I'm going to spend about 20, 25 minutes trying to give you an overview of what it was we were on about and what we've tried to accomplish with the Innovation Zones, where they've come from, where they're going, what they've accomplished, and um, what some of the lessons learned and takeaways are. Uh, with that overview fully implanted, then we'll be able to have a good conversation, I think. And so I'll hew pretty closely to my notes so that I don't digress and find, our, find ourselves completely out of time before we even get started. Let me find the clicker and I'll be off and running. So in 2009, uh, I actually started a charter schools office within the district in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, in Tennessee, local school districts are the, or were the, at that time the sole authorizers of charter schools, which I realize is different from the experience that you have here in uh, North Carolina. And we wanted to establish a strategic approval process that was focused on quality, collaboration, and turnaround. These were the purposes that we had in mind for our charter schools in Nashville, Tennessee. I believed we needed to authorize schools that would help us meet the greatest needs that the district had, rather than just allowing those schools to open that would serve students that we served, served well already and leave behind students that we've left behind already. We wanted to really target our efforts in building new schools to helping us to particularly meet the challenge of turning around uh, or at least creating new opportunities for our students in our lowest performing schools. And so that's the portfolio of charter schools that we set out to build. Uh, we focused on quality in the approval process as well as the performance management of charter schools so that we put quality first and by entering into a, a collaboration compact between our district and charter schools so that we would be working together to share resources and really capitalize on the economies of scale at the district but also be able to capitalize on some of the flexibilities and nimbleness of the charter schools that we were approving. And then finally to work on turnaround by offering new choices for families in low performing schools and also, and then uh, as was already mentioned, getting into the work of directly converting the management of some of our lowest performing schools to charter management, see if that would give us a lever on turnaround that we didn't have before. So I think it's important to understand my perspective on uh, charter schools and that what we were trying to do was create new options for families who had the least options available to them to begin with uh, because I think that turnaround was really at the heart of what we were trying to accomplish when we started the charter schools office in the first place. In 2010, we developed a plan to combine our charter schools work with the emerging need for a district strategy for turning around our lowest performing schools. And so we issued a call for proposals to convert our lowest performing middle school into a charter managed school. And uh, Julie Kowal was instrumental also in helping us to think through some of that on the front end. So it was great to catch up and see her today. Through that process, we ultimately began what turned into a phased conversion of the charter of the management of that school from district management to charter management. And it was phased, meaning that we did it a year at a time, a grade at a time. So we really had to kind of beat the bushes and scramble just to get three proposals. And really, only one of those proposals was really even remotely ready for prime time. And it was a proposal that said, we can do this, but we're going to have to do it a year at a time. We're going to have to build as if we were starting a new school, but start it within the context of the school that was already there. Uh, this created a, a problem that became very apparent to me, and that was that the students that were in the school when it became the lowest performing school in our district 
would ultimately never be a part of the conversion that was underway. They'd start with the lowest grade, and that would bypass the students who were already there. And so we began to, I began to get particularly more interested in what do we do to turn around the circumstances on a more quick time frame for the students who are in the school to begin with, even if this long-term conversion has some advantages in terms of sustainability and the ability to kind of keep the school moving forward once the phase conversion was complete. So the phase conversion idea meant that we wound up operating two schools within a single building during the transition to charter management. And you can see from this slide that each year the grades managed by the charter school in the green there would increase and each year the grades managed by us in the district would decrease in their numbers. And so during that conversion period I really became singularly responsible for leading turnaround in those district grades and that was largely because the district didn't really have a strategy for turning around low performing schools and um, really a lot of people in the district kind of felt like if you want to turn around a low performing school get them to do things that high performing schools do and that was really correct but also an oversimplification of the situation that we found ourselves in and so that's one of the reasons that I got more directly involved in turning around work in turnaround work through district structures as I started to investigate what it was the district was doing about turnaround and turning around low performing schools, I, I um, dug into the data and this, this was a slide that became pretty important to me in terms of articulating a reason for us to get more deeply involved in turning around our lowest performing schools. And it has to do with the relationship between the district and the accountability system that was the accountability system under No Child Left Behind that was implemented by the state and which was swiftly about to be backed up by the newly created Achievement School District. And what this slide shows is that with each successive stop on the uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the path of, uh, of the accountability um, standards from target to school improvement one, school improvement two, corrective action, restructuring one and two, the likelihood that we would see that school turn around and be restored to good standing diminishes dramatically. So at the target status, we had had some success in finding schools, back, getting schools back to good standing status after missing just one, one year. But once they missed the target two, three, and four years, it became very unlikely that we would ever see those schools return to good standing. And this particularly uh, lined up with uh, an increasing number of our schools that were beginning to miss AYP at that time. And so it made it possible for us to begin to question, you know, what is the end game of all of this accountability? What is, the, uh, what is waiting at the end of the line for all of these schools? And with the Achievement School District being created, people in the district were much more interested in finding out uh, how we could tackle this challenge rather than waiting for all of our schools or large numbers of our schools to find their way further down this path. I also began to dig into the reasons behind this poor record. Uh, this was partly related to the work that we were doing in converting the management of our middle school. I did a number of focus groups and interviews with teachers, but I also started to really probe into the central office staff and try to figure out why this was the situation. And I already mentioned that a lot of people in the central office just kind of thought, well, these schools are failing because they're not doing the right things. They're not implementing with fidelity the programs that they ought to be implementing in order to be successful. And that sounded pretty good from the central office perspective, but from the school perspective, um, we found that that really overlooked almost completely the characteristics that were present in low-performing schools. Uh, for example, the role of poverty, the conditions of despair and futility that kind of pervade the building after you get up and try to do your best every day and you come back with the same results, feelings of helplessness, and a real growing tendency ultimately to blame students for the failure of the school rather than looking for ways to change the circumstances so that students could have greater success. So from the perspective of the people inside the struggling schools, the central office approach was really experienced as a host of outside <coughs> mandates and programs, things that were piled on top of them to do, uh, all well-meaning, and they all sounded good, but too overwhelming to constitute a clear or sharp strategy, and ultimately creating conditions on the ground where people just kind of wait it out and wait for the next initiative to come along. Now how this related to what we were doing in the district at the time is, and I like to show this slide because 
Some people put a lot of effort into this slide. <laughs> this is our district's theory of action. So uh, this slide has been really well vetted and, and uh, used over and over again. But it's important because I think um, we were able to tap into our district's theory of action. It's a good theory of action. And tapping into it as an approach to turning around our lowest performing schools uh, gave us some continuity, made it possible for people to take some risks in the central office and actually trying to do the things that we were asking them to do. And I think ultimately it's probably a good theory of action for turning around low performing schools, but it's a little counterintuitive because a lot of times when we think about low performing schools, we think, well, we've got to show them how to fix their problems rather than empower them to fix their problems themselves, which is in essence what we were trying to accomplish. So from the standpoint of our district's theory of action, this is the central office down here providing support for schools and account holding schools accountable. It's an educational support system. It's not a system of mandates and programs that are expected to be followed, but rather a resource base that can provide support to a school to be successful. The primary lever that we're after is personalized learning so that the experience that the students has, the students have is uh, well tailored and matched to each individual student, meeting them where they are, helping them to achieve the standards where those goals are. Uh, and we then focus on three strategies, transformational leadership, equity and excellence, and quality teaching as a way of providing the resources for personalized learning to occur. This then enables our students to grow, achieve, and be empowered to take control of their own learning. Uh, this is the downward action. This is the upward result in terms of student success. I think it's important because that theory of action I, I didn't see evidence of that theory of action in our turnaround schools, and when I pointed out that misalignment, it really helped us, I think, to gain some traction internally in moving to work uh, to change conditions in our lowest performing schools. All right, so what is the I-Zone and how does it work? Simply put, the I-Zone is an arrangement to separate schools in need of turnaround from the district's business as usual approach to identify leaders who possess the competencies that successful turnaround leaders demonstrate, to empower them and give them flexibility to design their schools from the inside out, working with teachers and teacher leaders to build a broadly owned community, and ultimately to create the conditions that are present in high performing, high poverty schools, ultimately holding them accountable for student results. This diagram is simply a way of looking at uh, traditional district control on the left and more outside the district uh, flexibilities that you find in charter schools on the right. Charter schools have particular flexibilities over people, money, program, and time. And the idea of a turnaround setting, at least in terms of the innovation zones as we conceived of them, was to bring some of that flexibility inside the district's operations so that the schools could be built from the inside out and they could take the teachers and teacher leaders in the building could take ownership of what it was they were trying to accomplish. So the theory of action behind the I-Zone is built on creating conditions for success, identifying turnaround competent leadership, empowering people in schools with flexibility to act decisively, and redesigning schools to meet the particular needs of economically disadvantaged students. Uh, the I-Zones, at least the I-Zone in Nashville, attempted to grant charter-like flexibility to schools that were managed within the district. And this meant that flexibility, uh, meant the, excuse me, this meant that flexibility and support had to be protected so that the schools could exercise autonomy over staffing, scheduling, et cetera. And the protection of that autonomy is probably the greatest challenge when you're operating within the district, but it's also the one that bears the greatest opportunity for reward, at least as we conceived of the, of the turnaround challenge. Now this approach came from our experiences, especially our experience with the conversion of our lowest performing middle school, but also from this mass insight report called the turnaround challenge. I don't know if you're familiar with it or not, but uh, in the essence of this report, they examined high performing and high poverty schools and identified the conditions that were present in schools that were both high performing but also had high concentrations of impoverished or just economically disadvantaged students in the school. And they found uh, three clusters of readinesses that were evident and apparent in those schools. Uh, the first was the readiness to learn, and this is the cluster of uh, the cluster of circumstances around student supports, both social and emotional supports, safety in the school and school environment that made it possible for the conditions to exist for students to learn. The second readiness is the readiness to teach. This is the whole cluster of of uh, of 
um, characteristics around professional development of teachers, highly effective teaching, teaching capacity. And then finally, the readiness to act, and this is probably the one that is the most related to the theory of action behind our innovation zones, and that is that they had the resource authority and the resource ingenuity, the ability to think creatively and design their own outcomes, design their own use of resources so that they could be effective from the inside out of the school. Now, I mentioned that the Achievement School District had been created about the same time. And as the Achievement School District was beginning to be operated by the state, uh, they began to discover some of the same things that we discovered in terms of the capacity for charter operators uh, to operate schools, as well as kind of the capacity to operate schools directly in conditions of turnaround. And they began to think about working with innovation zones to expand that capacity. So this became a positive, I think, symbiotic relationship. And as part of our AYP waiver that they uh, wrote at the state, they then formally adopted the innovation zone concept and tried to give it some, some criteria so that they could judge whether uh, innovation zones were legitimate or whether they were innovation zones in name only and begin to provide some of the resources from the school improvement grants to support innovation zones being successful. Uh, I'm not going to read all of this, but these are some of the characteristics that uh, they uh, looked for in identifying legitimate innovation zones. So I'll give you just a quick overview of what an innovation zone, structurally speaking, had to have. Uh, it had to have certain structures, meaning it had to have an office in the district that reported directly to the superintendent, which took it out of the leadership structure of the traditional curriculum and instruction office. It had to have a certain level of staffing, and it had to have the autonomy to direct the schools to make their own decisions at the school level. There had to be policy adaptation agreed to by the school board and the administration so that that flexibility, particularly in staffing and, and hiring, was present. School leaders had to be given managerial autonomy to make decisions, particularly about staffing, but also about budget and the design of their schools. Uh, the state had a specific role in terms of oversight, as well as flowing and administering money that came primarily from the school improvement grant funds. And there were consequences of failure, and I'll show you a little bit more about that in a minute, but essentially schools that weren't showing improvement after two years would be taken directly into the Achievement School District. And schools and, and I-Zones that didn't show uh, improvement at least equal to the improvement in the Achievement School District were to be frozen and not able to grow any further uh, as a consequence of that failure of, of their action. Some more characteristics of the structure, human capital changes had to be in place at the district. There had to be good oversight to hold schools accountable on the back end for the outcomes. The central office needed to be organized to provide support for the schools. I've already mentioned managerial capacity in the leadership and technical assistance could be provided by the state or provided by outside groups that were contracted with to provide that assistance. So how did the I-Zone relate to these other turnaround efforts? This is a map that goes from the first year of the Achievement School District's operation in 2012-13 um, all the way through 15-16. And this is a conceptual map of how the various turnaround initiatives in the state fit together. So you have the Achievement School District, which starts small but is intending to grow each of those years. That growth is limited by the capacity for charter operators primarily, but also the capacity to direct run schools, which they did some as well. Then secondly, you have the innovation zones growing, and the obvious intention here is for the innovation zones in the Achievement School District to really manage the entire portfolio of our priority schools in the state. And just to give some context, Priority schools, the bottom 5% schools as defined in our state, comes to about 85 schools. So it's a manageable number, but it's not the kind of number you could manage right off the bat. But there were some other efforts, both under school improvement grants and some direct LEA work that was ongoing when they launched this initiative, and those were to be phased out. They were not to grow uh, in lieu of the other two growing during, that, during the transition. Now, um, in order to ensure that I-Zones were real, they put all those structural requirements on I-Zones from the, from the beginning. But this is the outcome-based judgment of, of how I-Zones are doing. So the schools over on the left in the blue column are supposed to be given two years of unimpeded autonomy to work to improve their schools with staffing changes, design changes, budget flexibility, et cetera. At the end of those two years, they're supposed to have a, a progress check 
based solely on their uh, achievement data outcomes. And that's another thing that I probably should say is that uh, the definition of our priority schools in Tennessee is based solely on achievement. There is no growth measure as a component of that, which is an interesting feature, but um, something that enables this to become a little bit more simplistic in terms of how you evaluate outcomes. There were these three questions that were asked during the, pro the, during the progress check at the end of two years. Uh, first is, has the, has the school met its annual measurable objectives, which were issued by the state um, on the order of 5% gains in their overall achievement across three subjects, which is pretty significant. Um, had the school met those AMOs for two years in a row, if they did, they would return to good standing, they'd be out of the priority list. If they didn't, then they would continue in the innovation zone, provided that question number two and question number three are satisfied. Question number two was, has the school failed to improve? So they were looking for schools at least to show progress, even if they weren't meeting those five-point AMOs. <laughs> and if the school had failed to make progress, it was supposed to be immediately moved into the Achievement School District as a consequence of that failure. If they were making progress short of those AMOs, but still making progress, then the school could continue in the I-Zone. And then lastly, the I-Zone's portfolios themselves were, were measured and uh, compared to the progress of the portfolio in the Achievement School District. And if, the, if any particular I-Zone's portfolio were improving less rapidly than the Achievement School District was improving, then their growth was to be frozen. They weren't to add any other schools. But on the other side, if they were growing at least equal to the growth in the Achievement School District, then, that, then the I-Zone would be allowed to grow and add schools, particularly when the next cohort of priority schools was identified. They do that every three years. <coughs> So how'd we do? What's happened? All of the schools in the uh, first I zone in Nashville, um, we're proud to say, grew. Uh, they all showed improvement. Uh, this is an example. This is this is simply all of the schools. Uh, I mentioned the success rate. This is how they identify priority schools. It's just the average of pro proficiency rates across science, math, and English. Um, and for uh, the set of schools in Nashville, uh, they showed a prox on, on average about a 14 and a half point gain over uh, three years. So we were pretty pleased with that. Um, but on, on the one hand, on the other hand, we of course had much higher ambitions than that. So we were not as pleased as if it had been 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 points because these schools obviously started out so far behind the schools that other students were attending and we really had high aspirations for that. Um, nevertheless, this is significant growth. Um, we have about 160 schools in our district and outside of the I-Zone schools, there were only 10 schools district-wide that made growth faster than 14.5% over that same time period. So uh, we were pleased with the results, at least from that standpoint. Our district's accountability system um, is a little bit of this eye chart here. Uh, these are individual years, one, two, and three, and this is the three-year average. This is really kind of what we look at as the, what would be the equivalent of an A through F measure. Uh, this accountability system is based on more than just achievement. It takes into account about 50% growth measures, also some college readiness measures, some gap reduction measures, and some school climate measures on the order of about 15% of the overall index. And you can see that all the schools in the I zone in the first year were at the bottom category, the red category, target is the bottom, review is the next. We had one school that really got out of the gates pretty strong, uh, but it had some conditions in place and had had a leadership change a little bit earlier. So we'll talk about that in lessons learned. But by the time we get to the end of the three years, at least five of those schools had performed well enough over the three years to have erased that target status in their three year average and are at least in the middle of the pack in terms of schools that uh, we have in our district. So that's another measure of, of the outcomes that we think went fairly well. Probably the most significant change that we saw in the schools was in the uh, percentage of teachers who were um, highly effective or, sorry, who, yes, who were, who were highly effective or very highly effective. They were above average teachers in terms of teacher effectiveness. And um, on the top chart, you can see three I zone priority elementary schools and for each of those you know they started in kind of the single digits in terms of the number of teachers in the school that were performing at that level and by the end of the three years we had upwards of 80% or more 
of the teachers in those buildings teaching at highly effective levels. I thought that was significant because one of the big challenges of turnaround is getting teachers who are highly effective and who have options to teach in other places to be present and teaching in your innovation schools. And that takes more, I think, than just kind of short-term compensation changes. Although we did some of that, it takes feeling a part of a team, being a part of a good leadership structure, and having some ownership of the school and the direction of the school. And by comparison, some schools that were also identified as priority schools but were not in our innovation zone didn't see the same kinds of shifts in their um, teaching effectiveness over the time that the iZone was up and running. All right, so I'm going to conclude here with a couple of uh, quick lists of some notable su su successes, uh, some notable shortcomings, and then maybe what I think are some takeaways, and that'll, that'll hopefully lead us into the conversation. Um, we, uh, we were able to uh, definitely see some advances in these kinds of, these specific goals. I mean, first, uh, principal empowerment was really at the heart of what we were trying to accomplish. So uh, we did the first real search for principals that had happened in the district. The district had a, a real traditional, still does really have kind of a real traditional uh, te uh, uh, principal development pipeline. You know, you, you go from being a teacher to being an AP to being a principal, and then you kind of move around from one school to the other. And when one school gets in trouble, you find a good principal and try to move them to that school, but it's not necessarily a good match between the leadership and, and the needs of that particular school. Uh, so we, um, search for principals outside of that pipeline. We wound up with about half of our principals uh, who had been principals in the district before, and about half of our principals who had not been principals in the district, in fact, had not been principals at all. We took a little bit of heat for that. Uh, but we identified those principal candidates according to turnaround competencies, <coughs> research-based turnaround competencies. Uh, we screened them using those turnaround competencies and then identified them uh, and, and gave them the opportunity to lead the school. And this really began to set the stage for empowering principals in ways that we hadn't done previously in the district. And this this is something that has gone now beyond the innovation schools and is something that is growing in the district as well. Secondly, uh, we built inside out school designs, so we swept away a lot of the mandates and a lot of the outside programs that came with missing AYP or falling further into target status and we empowered the leader of the school to build teacher teams within the school and actually design things like roles for teachers, the school day, the school calendar, professional development, and the other aspects of a teacher's life that um, teachers don't necessarily always feel like they have a lot of ownership or control over. And we encouraged and supported them in developing what their school would look like and how the responsibilities and roles in the schools would be carved up. Thirdly, uh, we implemented student-based budgeting, which has two components to it. Uh, the first component was we allowed the principal to control the allocation of resources, particularly among staff, so that they could actually change staffing roles and responsibilities. And we could talk about some of the uh, particular choices that they made, but that has to do with giving them flexibility in how they spend their resources. But we also developed a weighted student funding formula that was attached to this student-based budgeting. Uh, and that gave us a, li a little measure of sustainability planning because the schools that had high concentrations of need would then receive a greater share of the resources that were distributed to schools and have the flexibility to spend that money in the way that was aligned with the design that the teachers and the staff had, uh, had, had, had put together and were implementing. Um, and then lastly, I mentioned that we were successful in shifting pretty highly effective teachers into some of our uh, traditionally struggling schools, and I think that had as big an impact as anything else on the results that we saw. Lessons learned. Um, I think uh, this theme will come up again as you ask questions and as we talk about it. We designed all of this as we were implementing it, and so I think that's clearly a lesson learned that we would avoid if we could avoid it. Um, at the time, of course, we didn't have the, the time or the luxury to avoid it, but, but uh, definitely a lesson learned is to make changes in staffing ahead of time. Uh, we wound up actually, we, we had actually just implemented in Tennessee our new evaluation system. The new evaluation system basically went into effect the same year we started the Innovation Zone schools. So we hired these principals literally a month before school and sent them off to the school and said, you know, we're going to support you in staffing this building, but the first thing we need to know is 
how effective are the teachers in the building because we don't have any real basis for that. So here you go, here's your evaluation system, we get them trained up on that and they go in and then they start working through identifying who the staff are and they spent the entire first year really doing the hard work of evaluation, identification and making decisions about staffing uh, which delayed some of the you know, negative cultural aspects of teacher turnover and also um, you know, just put them a year behind in terms of the results that they were trying to achieve. Um, in our second cohort, which has just launched, uh, we had the luxury, we built into our school improvement grant requests the, uh, a six-month lead-in period for them to be in the school and do some work in the school. We also have the benefit of having the evaluation system in place and made some more of those staffing changes on the front end before we actually got started, but definitely a lesson learned. Secondly, the same thing is true for design. Uh, so, you know, we organized these groups together and said, you can build the school you want, uh, but you have, to, you have to do it now. And so they spent a lot of the first year really trying to do the legwork of design. And so the design elements also didn't take effect until the second year. And that is disruptive in the process of turnaround without question. So it would be better to do that in advance. Thirdly, um, I think this is you know, maybe pretty down in the weeds, but pretty important. As I look at um, our schools that are successful in highly impoverished areas, uh, particularly some of our charter schools that are doing very well, uh, probably the greatest distinguishing characteristic that I see is a very tight vision of instructional excellence that's shared among the faculty and for which, the, and about which, the faculty has a tremendous professional feedback uh, loop developed. And so, um, while we were relying on our evaluation system, which has a good vision of instructional excellence in it, people were not well enough aware of that at the outset to really have ownership of it and be confident enough to give one another really good feedback. And so it took longer for us to develop those cultures of professional communication that are essential to really highly effective schools. We saw it start to develop and we've seen some successes, especially in some of the teacher effectiveness measures that, we, that, that I identified earlier. Uh, but that took a while and I think that's probably an inescapable thing that every school needs and, and really when people say what low performing schools need to do in order to be successful is act like high performing schools, I think if they can get this part right then they're going to be way down the road in moving in that direction. And then lastly, um, we, uh, we didn't have uh, near the time or resources to develop the community connections that we needed. Um, we have to do things differently in our low performing schools or we're going to continue to get the same results. But one of the things that we really need to do differently is to make the schools hubs of their community and being able to do the legwork of coordinating and organizing the social service organizations and the nonprofits in the area is something that's right at our disposal in Nashville. We have tremendous nonprofit community available and ready to work. Uh, but as we were undertaking the work of instructional excellence in the building, it just wasn't the leftover resources or time to do the organization and coordination of the, uh, of the social and emotional supports that were needed. And I think that's worth investing in independently and on top of what you're doing on the instructional side if you want to be successful in turning around low-performing schools. All right, notable takeaways. Um, and this, I'm going to step back just a little bit further and um, talk a little bit about the relationship to the Achievement School District in, in all of this. Uh, but I, I think these are things that um, you know, we, can, we can talk at length about uh, over the next few minutes. Um, first of all, collaboration is important. Uh, it's important for districts, I think, to have a stake in what the Achievement School District was trying to accomplish. It's difficult enough for the Achievement School District to build a good relationship with the district if they're completely an outsider to what the district is doing. Uh, but on the other hand, if they are working in tandem to expand capacity to support low performing schools and support school turnaround, then I think they can be more effective in terms of supporting the capacity of the district to be successful. If the two entities are pulling for each other, it really helps. It's very difficult to get the two entities, the district and achievement school district, pulling for each other because they almost you know, structurally in this sort of antagonistic relationship. But I don't think it's impossible, and I think it's something that can definitely, uh, we've definitely seen some elements of that uh, to, to the success of what we've been trying to accomplish in Nashville, even though it's difficult and you have to be intentional about it. Pitting one approach against the other is dangerous. 
but also effective. You know, one of the reasons that um, we had success in getting innovation zones started in the first place was because the existential threat of the Achievement School District and people in the district wanting to kind of continue to hew their own path and to be responsible for the schools that they're responsible for rather than uh, giving them up to an outside entity. Uh, but at the same time, uh, if that outside entity is then in an antagonistic relationship, it really makes it possible, makes it makes it hard for that capacity to be brought to bear where it can be successful. And you know, at the end of the day, there's just a lot of work to be done. And there's one path to entry into this work through charter schools, and there's one path to entry through traditional district schools. There might be one path to entry through the achievement school district or innovation zones, and it's different people who come through those different doors and it's only by kind of opening all those doors that at least we thought we could begin to approach the capacity that we needed to be successful um, and so we were at our best when we were working together with that mindset and we were at our worst when we were kind of turning our swords against each other and battling with each other and, and there's been plenty of that you know to be real straightforward and frank the work is hard and but finding fault is easy and so you have to build the conditions for success if you're going to be serious about turning schools around, and that means working together with people, even if you disagree with them sometimes. Secondly, time is required. Um, we had three years, which I thought was that I thought that was fine because you know these are four-year schools, and once you change three three fourths of the students in the school, they can be brought up from the beginning on these new expectations and this excellent instruction that's in the building and be successful. That's a little naive. Um, it's particularly naive if you're building it while you're flying it, as I mentioned, but I think probably maybe you know, the three to five years and with the planning year uh, on the front end of that, that three to five years makes a lot more sense now. Um, I also think it's really important to develop a benchmarking and progress monitoring system that can distinguish those schools that are not moving in the right direction from those that are legitimately starting, but can, can communicate that progress is being made. We approach this as if, well, at the end of three years, you'll know that we were successful, so just give us three years. But the forces of opposition that can kind of, and doubt, that can kind of creep into that, uh, make that sound good, but in practice, not be as effective. And so we would do a better job, I think, defining what those interim benchmarks and interim progress points were, um, so that we could really tell who was moving in the right direction and who wasn't, but so we could also sort of make it possible for people to think this is working in the right direction or at least headed in the right direction so that we could build support for the work that we were doing rather than kind of always being naked to the, hey, are we there yet kind of question. Thirdly, staff and design first. I think I've, I've uh, mentioned that ad nauseum. Uh, you just need to do that work on the front end until that work's done. I think the traction of turnaround is not really, um, is, is not really fully in in place and by delaying it uh, not only does it hurt your ability to produce the results you've promised in the time frame that you've promised but it also um, you know adds fresh disruption to the turnaround process which is pretty fragile when it gets gets going in the first place fourthly uh, you really have to work at or we did at least have to work at autonomy and the school support role um, here are some a couple of examples of, of things that happened in the central office when we started this um, we started with the idea that innovation zone schools would be in a position to make staffing decisions that would ultimately lead some teachers leaving those schools. And the problem with that was that every other principal in the entire district believed that they were going to get all these cast offs from the innovation zone schools. And so, you know, right from the get go, before there were any movements, remember I told you the first year we really didn't move any teachers, but I spent the first year sort of fending off criticisms and attacks from principals in the district who said, this is not fair, this is ridiculous. And understandably, they would have that reaction. But as a result of that reaction, the human capital flexibilities that were necessary to what we were trying to do began to be constrained. And you really have to work at that both structurally and politically in order to maintain the flexibilities and to help communicate with the people who, you know, understandably have those kind of negative reactions. Likewise, if we would, were interested in putting in place a, a, a different piece of learning technology in the school or something that was outside of the norm, uh, there was a real tendency in the central office to say, well, that's, you know, that's hard for us to do that. Why don't you just use this one over here? Why don't you just do it this way? And there's a real tendency in the district to sort of re-standardize things that you're trying to break off. 
Uh, and, and you just have to be aware of that and be realistic about that from the get-go and have a lot of good relationships and good conversations as well as some significant structures in place to prevent that from happening if you're really serious about giving schools the autonomy to act decisively in their own unique way. Fifth, communicate and secure buy-in. I think that runs through all of these things. Uh, people need to understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. It's hard enough to understand why you're getting away with special favors. If you don't actually do the legwork of communicating, um, that's, that's where it's a situation where it's never enough, and I think you know that in most kind of change initiatives. It's, it's never enough, no matter how hard you, could, how hard you try to communicate and how much buy-in you get, uh, but the more you have, obviously, the more successful you're going to be. Um, Sixth, six, cultivate community supports. I already mentioned um, that we had um, an uneven approach to this and that we really probably should, benef should have benefited from investing directly in it. So we had one school where the principal was really good at coordinating external supports and they had every nonprofit in the city working very effectively and seamlessly in the school and almost no focus on instructional improvement. And so as a result, we didn't get a whole lot more out of the classroom environment, even though we, the school became a really cool place to be and it was a lot of fun. Uh, and so that was one end of the extreme. And then we had some at the other end of the, of the spectrum where they were just head down, really working hard on instruction, working great as a team. And we saw some instructional improvements that were pretty remarkable, but they didn't have the uh, community support in place. And you really have to do both those things. You have to walk and chew gum on those fronts at the same time. A lot, we have too many debates over you know, whether the cause of low achievement is poverty or poor instruction or some other conditions. It's, it's all of those things. And you have to really invest in all those things seriously in order to be successful. At least that's a takeaway that, that, that I take um, uh, pretty clearly. Lastly, plan for sustainability. Um, we did a little of this in terms of the student-based budgeting design that I talked about, but we didn't uh, do as much to make the idea of promoting school turnaround a sustainable concept. And so we funded our entire innovation office and all of our sort of central apparatus with school improvement grant funds that went away. And the district never made its own investment in that school turnaround effort, just like it would in a literacy program that it thought was really important to literacy. And there's a lot communicated about that in terms of what we think it takes, what we think the importance of it is. Uh, but practically speaking, it makes it difficult to continue those initiatives that might be having some success or even to expand them to other schools that have similar needs in terms of growth. And, and, and we're really still only talking about the narrow set of the bottom 5% schools. There's plenty of schools that need a lot of support and a lot of growth in the short run. And you have to make those investments, I think, if you want to see that be successful. And so that's what I have for you. And I'm really looking forward to the opportunity to hear what you're thinking and uh, what your perspectives are. But thanks for taking the time.